When I was in Hebron, I was shocked by how aggressively the police state imposed an apartheid system. All of the residents I talked to had horror stories of life under brutal occupation. Sometimes Israeli soldiers themselves dissent, even in the face of very severe repercussions. One of whom is Aran Afrati, who was stationed in Hebron during his time in the Israeli army. Since leaving the military after years as a combat soldier, Afrati has dedicated his life to documenting Israeli war crimes and fighting the apartheid system. Iran, you went from being a soldier in the IDF to being a very outspoken critic of both the occupation and continued takeover of Palestine. What made you go through such a profound transformation? Well, uh, it didn't something that happened immediately. Obviously, growing up in Israel, you know, you ask me what was my role in the military. I'm not sure that my role started with my enlisted. I think my role started when I was about five and I realized that my father is putting uniform and going out to Lebanon uh, as a reserve soldier. That's the first time I felt that I'm a part of the military. Uh, the next time was in uh, you know, kindergarten when soldiers came in to tell us about uh, the independent war uh, just after the Holocaust Day Memorial. Um, the next time will be when I was 16 and uh, I will get my first draft letter and in this draft letter, it will be written that I am a property of the military. This is something that every kid in Israel goes through. When you're getting into the military system in the end, you're already so much embedded inside the military. The military is a part of your identity. It's as much you as you are Israeli or Jewish, for that matter, in Israel. And going into the military, I was expecting to be a manifestation of me, just in uniform, uh, protecting my country, protecting my family. I grew up on hearing the stories from Auschwitz of my grandma. So my uh, mother's side, my grandma and grandpa was the only survivors from their family, from the Holocaust. Uh, all of my grandma's family were killed in Auschwitz. The stories from my grandpa that was also the only survivor from his family from the Holocaust. And from the other side, my grandpa and grandma from my father's side, grew up and hearing this, their stories about Jerusalem and what it is to grow up without freedom under the British mandate. For me, being in the military is to protect them and to make sure that our life will go on as in freedom and you know, in good uh, will. Um, I went through seven months of boot camp, and in the end of the seven months, I found myself in Hebron, uh, the, the only city that have a settlement in the middle of the city. So getting into the Hebron, uh, one of the first things that I had to do was protect a Jewish holiday. And my job is to put on curfew 180,000 Palestinians. So settlers from throughout the West Bank and Israel, Jewish settlers, could come into Hebron and celebrate. So there's th thousands and thousands of uh, Israelis and Jewish settlers from across the West Bank coming to celebrate. And the only way to keep them protected is to make sure that not, no Palestinian is living his home. So literally one of my first tasks was to roam the streets and make sure Palestinians understand they're going into their home and they cannot leave until a second notice, until the next time we're coming in. And the first time was like a movie. You know, we, we birthed in into the city with our guns in our hands and our uniform and vest with grenades and uh, six packs of ammunition. And we just scream in curfew. And you see the chaos. You see the people just running from place to place, closing down their shops, running home. Because wherever you are when the curfew starts, this is where you're stuck. And you cannot go anywhere else. So you better be at home when we're starting to come the curfew. Now, the official orders uh, to anyone who breaks curfew is shoot to kill. I never did that. I never met anyone who shoot to kill uh, in this process of a curfew. But that was the orders, and they knew it pretty well. They knew what they need to do. Uh, this feeling of power uh, at once came as a big confusion to me. I think I, I wasn't clear um, if I'm enjoying the power of controlling all of these people or if I don't understand why kids look at me frightened. Why are they running away when I'm walking into the street? Before my service, I work as an educator. I love kids. So I think I was very confused on why a, a kid will find me uh, scary. You know, I, I realize now in, perspe in perspective it got to do something with the fact that I have my boots on, my uniform, my helmet, uh, my six packs of ammunition, my two hand grenades, my M16 in my <laughs> hand. 
but I didn't realize that right. at the time. Right. And, I, and I really couldn't understand that. Um, and I think in a very rapid pace, I realized that my job is actually to maintain an apartheid system. Very, uh, very early on, I understood that the rights that the Jewish settlers have are not the rights that the Palestinians have. I understood that I cannot touch a Jewish settler if he is attacking a Palestinian. The best I can do is call a local police department to come handle it, like I would do at home in Jerusalem. So these Jewish settlers that live in Hebron are living under the same rights that I live in, in Jerusalem, but the Palestinian next to them, next house over, next building over, sometimes next apartment over, lives under my rule, my military rule. And I can do whatever I want with him. I can take his home as a temporary base for a few hours to a few days to a few weeks. I can decide that I'm arresting the people of the house and tying them up to defense of my base. Um, if we will get an order to demolish their home or just lock their front door and don't let them out into the street, their house is on, a street that only Jewish settlers can walk on. And Palestinians cannot, so they have to walk through windows to yards into the other side, into the Kasba of Hebron. I think realizing all of that in a very, very early stage in my service helped me understood that someone was lying to me along the way. I didn't feel like I'm protecting anyone. I didn't feel like I'm helping anyone feeling more safe. I feel like I'm terrorizing people. I feel like for the first time in my life, the boundaries between good and bad that I learned as a kid, and obviously I learned that I'm on the good side, uh, was broken. I felt like I am the terrorist. And my job was literally to scare people so they cannot think about acting against the Israeli settlers or the Israeli military. That was actually our defined mission, to make sure that to instill fear in the hearts of Palestinians in Hebron. And that's exactly what we did. I think Hebron is a really um, intense example of, of apartheid, obviously. Like you just said, the settlements in the middle of the city, it's extremely visible. You have the caged streets, the ghost town. It's, it's horrifying. Why did you speak up and why did you do what you did knowing that you would suffer such repercussions and potentially be banned from returning back to your country? Um, well... Growing up in Israel, like I said, I believe that I was the good guy. I mean, the story that all of us are being told all around the world is that the, the very clear difference between good and bad people are there. You learn about the Holocaust growing up. I saw my grandma screaming in the middle of the night, memories from Auschwitz in our mind, memories to our family. Um, I knew that I am going to be a good human being. You know, in the age of uh, 15, 16, I began being almost obsessed with trying to understand the Nazi side in the Holocaust. Uh, not only to hear the stories of the victims, of the Jewish victims and any other victims from the Holocaust, but to try to understand how can a, a Nazi soldiers get up in the morning, give his kids a kiss, his wife a hug, and go out to the camps and do his job. I just couldn't understand that. And when I got into the occupied territories, uh, for the first time I understood how can there be a contradicting inside yourself. As a human being, you could do your job and be a one person at home, be a loving, caring uh, you know, boyfriend or a son or a brother, uh, and at the same time hold people under a regime so oppressed that people are dying not from only your bullets, but the amount of calories uh, being entered into their territory, like in Gaza, from depression or sickness. Uh, this realization during my time as a soldier uh, of me on the right side of history, gave me this urge that something have to be done, something have to be spoken, understanding that nothing is really changing from inside that you have to step outside and start talking with the world about what's going on. Uh, and that's the only way you can live in a place, not only for Palestinians, but for me as well. You know, I don't want to live in an ethnocracy. I don't want to live in an only Jewish state that values uh, a privileged Jewish life on every other life. This urges me to understand that I want my kids to grow up 
in a place when they don't have to oppress anyone, they don't have to be soldiers. Uh, I guess that's what pushed me to do what I'm doing. Your humanity. <laughs> Let's talk about your time um, after getting out of the military and then you went through a series uh, through the West Bank, interviewing soldiers, getting their testimony. Talk about some of your experiences there that cemented your belief system now and um, open your mind a little bit more. I think after I left the military, I was still under the impression that the things that I was going through were my personal uh, experience. I understood that I do not believe in the things that I was doing. I understood that I was lied to, but I still didn't have the conviction that what we're doing is on a large scale. And leaving the military and starting interviewing soldiers uh, really, I think, made me understand that there's a system medic oppression uh, that is taking place in the occupied territories. Iran, let's talk about Elor Azaria, the soldier who just got convicted of manslaughter. He executed an unarmed Palestinian man laying in the street, of course, in Hebron, on camera. Uh, Israel, of course, is touting this as accountability, right? Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your reaction to the verdict and, yeah, just your ca the case in general? I think the uh, Lior Azaria case had to be understood by a few contexts. Mm -hmm. The first one is the context of uh, Israeli military practice of ex executions and targeted killing and also confirming a kill, what Lior Azaria did on the Palestinian in Hebron, uh, are all practices that are alive in the military system, in the even police system or Mossad. It's illegal to continue doing execution. It's the middle of the previous decade in the 2000s. But then something very interesting started. Um, I am, in my previous role as a researcher into the Israel military, I was taking testimonies from many soldiers. Uh, and one of the soldiers I'm reaching to is a soldier from a semi-elite unit called, in Hebrew, Duvdevan, a cherry in English. And he's telling me a story about how uh, he's serving after this role from the, after this new rule from the Supreme Court is being mandate and they cannot do targeting killing anymore and how their officer is gathering the unit together and telling them we're going to go out tonight to capture this person is highly dangerous what we're going to do is we're going to come in five or six people's unit into their home in the middle of the night break in quietly go up to his bedroom go into his bed and put a gun into his head. Now, if he just wake up and surrender, we're taking him into the base. But if he scream, you shoot him in the head. If he lift his blanket, you shoot him in the head. If he lifts his hands or legs or trying to uh, do any movement, you shoot him in the head. Now, because we understand as rational human beings that no human being can wake up in the middle of the night with a gun into his head and not scream or move, we understand these orders as an execution orders that bypass the Supreme Court order. Uh, and instead of saying we're going to execute this person, they're saying we're going to arrest this person, but if we feel there's some kind of danger, maybe he have a gun in his bed, maybe he will scream for help, we execute him. So execution is something that is very much alive. I continue to interview dozens of this cherry unit that tells the same story about different cases, but the same exact practice in the occupied territories. They knew that this is what they're supposed to do. They knew that they were going into homes in the middle of the night to execute people. In October 2015, the latest intifada is starting, and even the official rules of not executing human beings are going off the window from the prime minister, into ministers, into media people. Everybody is talking about it from left to right, about you shoot to kill. If you see a girl with scissors next to you, you shoot to kill. Executions are very much alive in the Israeli uh, uh, military, the Israeli police, the Israeli discourse. People are calling for executions. People are calling for not only executions on, you know, what they call terrorist or resistant uh, uh, people, Palestinians that are running at you, but they're calling for revenge. Um, and when the Dior Azaria doing what he does, he's doing it after he heard it, this specific order of executions, every, what they call a terrorist, from every section of the Israeli society.